many of you are familiar with the New Songs Project, but those of you who aren't, this is a, song, uh, a project that was inspired by a songbook here at the archives called New Songs for View Mining Camp. It has a bunch of youth specific mining and labor songs, and we have musicians from all across Montana who recreate those songs, add music to the lyrics, make it their own, and today we have Dublin Gulch here. And they will be doing a concert tomorrow night at the Clark Chateau at 7, and you can get tickets online or at the door. Thank you all for coming again. So I had the good fortune to ride down from Helena with Jim Schultz at our initial meeting with Christine to describe the project, and uh, I thought to myself that this poor woman has no idea what she just unleashed. Because <laughs> <laughs> Dublin Gulch is uniquely qualified for this particular job. Since 1992, Dublin Gulch has, has written and performed the songs of Butte, the Irish, the Mines, and the Union. Um, I've known Jim and performed with Jim for nearly 45 years, and I can tell you three of the things that Jim truly loves to do are historical research, writing music, and teaching, all three of which are exactly what this project is about. I will share with you that when Jim prepared his master's thesis, he did so much research that his first, pre sorry, his first professor retired, and his second professor finally told him he was about to retire and Jim needed to wrap things up. <laughs> Jim is a state and nationally recognized educator and even in retirement, he continues to be the guy who teaches the teachers. This gentleman, most of you know, is Tom Powers. He is a Butte native son. His father was an alderman and mayor in Butte from 1962 to 1969. Tom has worked in the clerk of the court's office and is actually right now the clerk of the court for another 20 minutes or so. <laughs> for 35 and a half years. Yeah, and I personally believe that he knows everybody in the city of Butte. <laughs> That's pretty close. Next is another Butte native. That would be Michael McCavanaugh, who while in the second grade single-handedly caused the temporary shutdown of the St. Lawrence O'Toole Parochial School <laughs> while all of the nuns and the priest conferred to determine whether his latest infraction had condemned his soul to eternal damnation. <laughs> you can feel free to talk to him later. About the details. <laughs> My name is Emerson Vorrell. I'm the setup guy and the enforcer. That means that I have to keep these guys on track and get y'all out of here in the allotted time. And finally, the man on my far right is John Joyner. Obviously, he is here for the eye candy. So with that, <laughs> Jim, your time starts now. Thanks, Emerson. I think. So thank you to Christine and Morgan, who I just met, but also to Kim and to Lindsay and all the folks at the Butte Super Bowl archives. This is one of my favorite places to come to and just hang out. It's really, you gave us this opportunity to be part of this project, which I really think is culturally unique and, and really important. The art of songwriting is, has many variables, but the most important variable is inspiration. Where is the muse? And in Butte, there is a bottomless shaft of, <laughs> of inspiration. There are thousands and thousands of stories in view, and for every one of those stories, there is a song. And I never, I never get tired of coming here, listening to the stories, and, and saying, how can I put this into a song? So when this project was given to us, I, I really you know, just relished the opportunity to, or the chance to use primary source documents to give a new voice to those lyrics written by individuals that sacrificed so much to build view and the West and the nation. So if you, if you came today to listen to a lot of talking, you'll hear Tom and I speak a little bit, but it's mostly going to be a introduction to these two songs that we chose out of the Butte uh, poems and songs for Butte Mining Camp and it's going to be a musical journey. And so what we've decided to do is, in order to understand
the context in which these two songs were written. And I think one was not a song. For instance, if you look down, it's called The Copper Strike of 17. That was written by Joe Kennedy. That was a poem. But the other one, which is Workers Unite, is, was definitely meant to be a song. We'll talk a little bit about that. But before we get to these two songs, we want to take you on a musical journey on how these two songs were created and why they were created and when they were created. So, and we're going to do that in song because that's what we do best, with a little bit of talking in between. Now, you're certainly welcome to join in and sit back and relax and drink your coffee or eat your, you know, your um, sandwich or whatever you like if you happen to bring something to eat. Clap along if, it, if the mood strikes you, and if you want to sing along, you can do that as well. So, but we're going to start off real quick with just a song. I'm going to grab my water, and this, this song is called The Copper Road. Um, save for the two songs that the Jim chose from the old song book, everything else you're going to hear from us today, he wrote. All right. So...
goes through the gallows ring. Brothers shout the last refrain of the miner's hope. Let the shadows be your guide. Can you hear them as they strive? The ghosts a miner side by side marching down the copper gold. song because it's kind of an uplifting song, it's kind of happy, but at the same time, if you listen to the words, there's a lot of, of hard work that's involved with that. And back in oh, 1878, the Butte Working Man's Union were, was established, and at that point in time, the miners were working 10 hours a day, and they were making $3 a day. So, that was, that if we translated that into today's um, currency, it would be about 80 bucks a day is what they were making. So, but even then, that was low. So, they... Done on time as well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Brendan McDonough, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and so, by 1885, the Miners Union had formed and they had created a closed shop, which means that if you wanted to get a job in the mines, you better make sure that you belong to the union. And so there was, it was a guarantee, if you belong to the union, you're going to have a, have a job in the mine. And at that point in time, the wage rose to be about $3.50. And that, during that period, there was more or less a sense of, of what we would call somewhat benevolent and friendly relations with the mine owners. Of course, it was Marcus Daly, and because many of those mine owners, like Marcus Daly, came from the bottom up, they were workers, and they understood what it meant to be a worker, they had a more, uh, a better understanding of what was going through. In fact, as you know, Marcus Daly loved hanging out with the, with the, with the guys, and so, with that, I want you to think about the song that was just that was just sung. The uh, there was a lot going on there, but there was this sense of maybe administration and unions were more on the same wavelength with each other. They could communicate, they could talk, and so at that point in time, Butte became known as the Gibraltar of labor, and and things were going well. And then we have this song, which kind of fits into that time period before electricity came into. Are we going to sing and talk, or talk and sing? We're going to we're going to actually sing. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm. Uh, this one's called Sarah Daly, and uh, Mark's Daly never had a, a daughter named Sarah, but. Uh, I don't know, I just thought it would work. <laughs> <laughs> if he had a daughter, he would name her Sarah. But he didn't. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> this, 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 this song's got a funny ending to it. We'll tell you, but tell you about it. So I want you to pay attention to these words and we'll try to do our best. Is there going to be a test? <laughs> you ready, guys? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Jack Strong and the dog is down into the mine. for their pay, ate hard rock dust for dinner, and scorned the light of day, day, scorned the light of day. Now there lived a fair young maid at the bottom of the mine. Her name was Sarah Daly, and the boys thought her just fine. Her eyes were of the dark. 
darkest brown, little lash of long and fair. Her legs were strong and slender, and chestnut was her hair, and chestnut was her hair. And it's Jack Straw, Jack and Roy, it's down into the line. What's more, Miss Air Baby, where the sun go and the shine? What's more, Miss Air Baby, where the sun go and Copper King's daughter. Mick and I put these two together, I don't know, uh, 23 years ago or so, and the Milwaukee Irish Festival had a song contest. And so we thought, well, shoot, we'll enter this. And we asked our good friend Kim McKee, who's also a really fine songwriter, that we said, you know, if we're going to enter a song, you have to enter a song. And so Kim sent off two songs. And the results were Kim won first and second and got to go on stage in Milwaukee. And, <laughs> and, Mick, and Mick and I got horrible mention. <laughs> <laughs> we still like it. So, so we were uh, <clears throat> talking about the Copper Road and, and mules. So we just want to take some time and talk a little bit about mules. Uh, a mule back in those days, a good mule, good Missouri mule back in those days, cost about $150 to $225, which is about oh, anywhere between $4,000 to $7,000 in today's. And by the way, if you want to buy a mule, I went and did a little research on this, what would it cost you today? Um, you could get a, a decent mule for $1,000 today, and a really, really super high-powered one for about $8,000. So things haven't changed too much. However... In, in the mule market. In, in the, the mule market. <laughs> <laughs> However, 
mules were a really huge investment, and because not only did you have to pay a, you know, a sizable amount of money, but you also had to enlarge the tunnels, you had to make sure that they had, uh, they were cared for, they had every major floor or, or level down there had a mule barn, and it was lit, and it was well, uh, well stocked, and these, these mules had to be uh, curried, and they had to be, had to have their feet cleaned, and of course watered every day, maybe sometimes three times a day. So when you invested in a mule, you invested an enormous amount of money. Not only did the tunnels have to be enlarged, but height-wise, but they had to be enlarged width-wise. But the benefit was that you had an animal that could pull six cars, whereas the trammer, the pusher, would only a man would only do one. So. Um, Tom, why mules? Well, mules as opposed to horses. Mules are really smart out animals compared to horses. And they're sturdier than horses and hardier than horses. And they tend to be less skittish than horses. And the mules were able to learn the paths down below in the mines. And they knew where to go, where to stop. Mm -hmm. and, and so they were a great asset there. There's a little poem that's very common. Or Commonly known in Butte. Uh, my sweetheart's a mule in the mine. I drive her with only one line. On the dashboard I sit and tobacco I spit all over my sweetheart's behind. <laughs> well, the, the reason they were contaminating the mule's flank was because that's where the ACM brand was. So it was a little sign of contempt for them. <laughs> and uh, mules were terribly expensive to maintain as opposed to miners. You didn't want you didn't want to lose a mule. But as we know from looking at the signs on the, the head frames up here, how many men lost their lives in that particular mine? Men were a dime a dozen. And they didn't get a nice farm to go off to in <laughs> their filler, you know. So um, Mules were used in the Butte mines until 1934. Around 1917, when electricity was was being or, uh, strung throughout the, the mine shafts, their purpose became less and less. So, well, yeah, Jim says there were the mules left the mines in 34, but I understand that well into the 60s and 70s, there were plenty of jackasses still. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point in time, <laughs> things are getting, things were changing in Butte, as you probably know. But um, Marcus Daly, in 1899, sold the Anaconda mining properties to Standard Oil. For $39 million, which today is $1.5 billion. So he was a very, very wealthy man. And he died at a relatively young age. He died in 58. But it's almost as if when Marcus Daly died, the friendly relationships with the employees, with the, with the miners, started to collapse. Because Standard Oil took over, and they started to consolidate all the mines under one company. So you just didn't have to deal with the individual copper kings anymore or various other mine owners. You had to deal with, as Tom said, the company. And we knew that there was a, a, all sorts of strife. The, the Butte Miners Union, which was Butte Miners Union number one, was in conflict. There were progressives and there were conservatives within the union itself. And we know just right over there, there is a, where the mine union hall was dynamited. Uh, by the time 1914 rolled around and the progressives and the conservatives basically were looking at old Irish and Cornish that were more or less on the conservative side. And you have all of these new people coming in from new immigrants coming in, like the Finns and the Serbs and the Croats. Um, there was some issue between these different ethnic groups, and within those ethnic groups, there was 
anger and frustration. And the Union Hall was dynamited, and that, of course, the company really appreciated that because that was the end of the Gibraltar that, as we knew it. Jim, let me, let me interrupt you for a second. You can interrupt as much as you want. Oh, oh. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, for a few years, had the great fortune to play with someone, play music with someone who witnessed the dynamiting of the Miners Union Hall, and that was John Harrington. Uh, he played with us until he was over 100 years old. And uh, one night I was, uh, I used to go down to his apartment on Virginia Street and play with him. You know, he played the accordion, and I backed him up on the guitar. And he'd tell me stories, and I was so amazed when he told me that, you know, because I, I thought of that as like happening a million years ago, and that, you know, everybody's long since dead and gone. He was a teenager. And um, also, I didn't understand, because I guess I just hadn't read enough about it, but I just thought it was like one big explosion, but it wasn't. It was a series. Uh, dynamite, you know, explosions throughout the course of the day that miners surrounded the building and just started throwing sticks at it. And this big crowd developed, so it became kind of a big party, you know. And John was there watching the whole thing, and, and it was, I mean, we were so lucky to have had him, you know. But that's how recent all this history is, you know. And for those who are wondering, our upper parking lot on the other side of the alley is is where the Miners Union Hall was. So, and that's the basic outline of the of the hall. So that happened in 1914. There was a two years previous to that, the ACM came up with the idea of the rustling card, which we will talk a little bit about later on when we talk about the copper strike of 17. But you have three years where Butte had no, no union representation at all. There was no more closed shop. It was, it was open, and with the rustling card, you really had no cachet in, in how your job was going to be secure, right? And then 1917 occurs, and there were lots of things that affected the massive strike that happened after the Granite Mountain speculative mine fire. But in April, the United States enters World War I, and um, it's interesting to note, and Martha, you can help me out with this, because when you did that wonderful county by county, and we're looking at the number of people who registered for the draft, right? Eastern Montana, it was you know, quite substantial, but in the good old Silver Bowl, Butte County, it was way down. And why didn't anybody register to be, uh, or enlist, uh, or register for the draft? You can imagine. First of all, they needed the miners for the, for the, for the war effort, the, the new war effort, but it was filled with Irishmen, and they didn't want to help the English in any way. And so, and, and the Austrians didn't want to be involved because they had relatives over there, and you had, and the Finns, the Finns, they just wanted to, if there was a, if there was a party to, to uh, uh, protest, they would join it. And so, <laughs> <laughs> so June 5th, big anti-war, and anti-draft uh, demonstration down here to the, to the point where the state militia was sent in. So here's Butte, the war, April, now it's June, it's June 5th, and then, Three days later, the fire starts. And as we all know, 168 men died. There were four, 415 uh, miners working the Speculator Mine and the Granite Mountain Mine that night. And 168 turns out to be about 40%. When you look at it in that perspective, that was an enormous. And of course, it was the worst hard rock mining disaster ever. There were some heroes, though, and this next song is about one. And it's never, I've never performed this in public, and so I, I'm looking forward to it. This is called The Ballad of Manus Duggan, and Manus Duggan was a 19-year-old nipper, and there are certain phrases in this song that you may be familiar with, you may not, but he was a nipper, and a nipper is someone who goes around and 
he helps repair the tools, he helps sharpen the drill bits. If, if a miner needs some assistance or some part or whatever, he's there. And so Manus knew every tunnel and shaft and added in this <coughs> complex. And thank goodness he did. So, ballot master.
until I did research for this, this project, but Maria meant ocean of bitterness. And so I think this song from her, his perspective, because he's pretty, he's got an ocean of bitterness. <laughs> so. I don't know how long ago Jim wrote that song. Years. Years. Many years. I had never heard him sing it until a couple of weeks ago. Wow. And when he was finished, speechless. That really tells the story. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, um, it's an unbelievable, powerful song. Yeah. That brings us to our. Uh, we get to do some. Uh, how are we doing for time? Yeah. Don't worry about oh, the time. Yes. If you guys go over, it's not a big deal. Well, I'm going to... And if people, if people need to leave, they can leave. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, please come back, we'll do better next time. <laughs> An editorial comment? <laughs> Thank you for We're coming. used to it. <laughs> well, we're going to get into our, uh, the songs that we chose here, but Tom's got something. No, no, um, I, I didn't. I, well, let's yeah, let's let's do that. We're going to get to these two songs, and Jim was the one, and Emerson perhaps were was in on the choosing of the songs. And how did that come about, Jim? Well, <coughs> I went over. Emerson and I went over, and we met Christine, and she handed out copies of uh, songs for songs and poems for a Butte mining camp. Uh, immediately, just started kind of leaking through them, and I chose, there were four that I really liked, because I wanted to, to pick songs that had more of an Irish focus, and so I chose this one, uh, I chose Workers Unite because it talks about the Irish, and there's some issues with the, with the Irish, and, then, and we'll talk about that with the IWW, with the overarching uh, purpose of the IW goal of the IWW was that and then um, Joe Kennedy he's an Irishman and, and he was there and he you know he will talk about Joe in a little bit and he wrote this poem and we just thought man this is a great story and he needs to have music behind it so that's the reason we chose that but uh, let's talk about singing in the mines <laughs> um, singing in the Mines, I think, came naturally along with s laborers singing in other areas. Um, we, we know that uh, the cotton picking slaves uh, sang during their, during their toils. And uh, 
uh, the railroad workers the same. Uh, and one of the things that these songs that these men sang on this hill was it was a, a uniting thing. It uh, provided a sense of camaraderie. And also, it was a way to speak against their oppressors without explicitly saying what they were saying. Um, but they sang that the Union songs were songs um, about the inhumane treatment that they, they uh, experienced. And uh, Jim had mentioned earlier about a nipper being a, a, a tool sharpener. Uh, at the time, these, the drills were metal drills that were held by, in, by hand, and then another miner would strike the drill. And so they'd use that <coughs> to stay in rhythm in, this, in the process of drilling the holes. Um, and the, the company and the bosses didn't like these guys singing. Um, <laughs> But they, they sang whenever they could, and uh, when, whenever they were out of earshot of the bosses, they'd sing. And uh, it was it got to the point where they could be fired for singing. Uh, and it was said, uh, "Get to work. This ain't no singing school." <laughs> <laughs> but by the time there were pneumatic drills and steam drills, you got a bunch of Irishmen and Cornishmen. They can't they can't help it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, but, but the steam drills put an end to the singing because they were just too loud. But the, they continued to sing in the drive <coughs> and on their way to and from their shifts. I'm going to hand out a rustling card because this factors into this <coughs> next song. So uh, thanks to Mick, Kevin, you're, you're getting your rustling card, but in order to get a rustling card, you know, what do they have to go through? Well, after the demise of the union, uh, the company put into practice these rustling cards. And you go to the employment office and fill out an application, a rustling card, and uh, you'd make references and they check the references. It could take two or three weeks before you got okay to go looking for a job, go rustling for a job. And it was essentially a license to, to go look for work. Uh, and if, if you satisfied them, then you'd get your rustling card, you could take the card mine to mine to see where there was employment available. Um, once you were hired, you surrendered the card so that, so that then you were stuck, essentially. Uh -huh. Then if you got laid off or fired, you had to start the process all over. Again. Huh. And if there was any hint that you were a union organizer, rabble rouser, troublemaker, you just didn't get a card. No card, no license to work. So the unions hated this, or anybody that wanted to start a union really hated it because it basically just undermined the legitimacy of the unions. You didn't have to belong to a union to get a job, like you once did when it was a closed shop. But you had to have a card. But you had to have a card on top of that. So uh, <clears throat> Progressive thought it blacklisted you know, any person who would be uh, amenable to the union, and they actually held a vote. Uh, and this was back before the union hall was, was long, because the, the rusting cars came into existence in 1912. They had a vote, the membership voted, and they wanted the rustling cards to be abolished. And it was a real close vote. But the conservative members of the, of the uh, Pew Miners Union just kind of ignored that. And then at that point in time, people like Thomas Campbell, who was more, who was more on the progressive end and on the rebellious end, he got booted out. And there's all sorts of intrigue that went on that will, that will raise its, its head here shortly. Uh, we're going to do the song that we, we chose, Workers Unite, and we'll talk a little bit about the international workers of the world. It was uh, a union organizing group that wanted a worldwide union made up of entirely of workers. And we're not just talking about mine workers. We're talking about loggers and apple pickers and, uh, and shirt makers and tailors and women who were in the sweatshops, you know, making clothing. It was 
multi-generational, multi-ethnic, and definitely uh, not gender spe specific. All and, and everybody. Socialist and, and very socialistic. However, the Socialist Party disavowed having any responsibility with the IWW. Anyway, we picked up this song because um, it basically is talking to the Irish group here in Butte, and, and one of the things that says you have to ban race prejudice from out your mind. Um, and race prejudice at this point in time could refer to African Americans, but more likely it referred to really wasn't a race, it was et ethnic, because they didn't like the Finns, you know? The Irish had been established in Butte for a long time. They had communities, they had churches, they had a responsibility, and they had stability. And the Finns came in, and the Croats and the Serbs, and they started to make their, their um, complaints known. And the Irish and the Cornish looked at them and said, you know, they're sloppy workers. They work too fast. They're putting people in danger. And they didn't like them. But the IWW said, you know, you got to, if you really want power, you've got to put that out of your mind. Um, the Irish would say, well, the IWW, you know what that stands for? I won't work. Yeah. I want whiskey. <laughs> and in this case, in 1917, Imperial Wilhelm's, Imperial <laughs> Wilhelm's warriors. So anyway, we decided that this needs to be a rousing yeah. sea shanty. So we turned this into a sea shanty. And I borrowed the melody from a, a sea song that was written around 1835-1840 called The Wellermen. And the Wellermen were uh, a group, they were called the Wellers, and the Weller brothers, and they were in New Zealand. And they had set up a whaling station on the east coast of New Zealand where all these specific whalers would come in and they would um, help supply the whaling ships. And so this song developed, but we loved the melody so much, I took the melody and I kind of twisted it around to make sure that it fit this Workers Unite. Because I thought, you know, they need to have something that really brings their... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, oops. yeah, this one would be helpful. So we're going to do it. You sure? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it. Okay. But we do it in unison, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. First time done in public, so here we go. <laughs> one, two, three, four. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. East smooth it came from air and shore. Come list to what I've got in store from Kelly. Race and clans, you came a fighting blood and noble strain. Your blood on every battlefield, you shed for master class to yield. But the iron hand in the name of state will bring you to an awful fate. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. But Irishmen, you're not to blame. In other lands, it's just the same. The workers of the world are slaves. The parasites are heartless knaves. If you be free, you've got to stand with working men in every land. Race prejudice, you've got to ban from out your mind for any man. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, go. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. 
Don't forget your brother's plight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Our interests are just the same from county court to the state of Maine. The bastards rule with iron hand from Egypt to Van Diemen's land. Now, iron sons, again I say, don't be slackers in the fray. The world for workers be your cry. Resound aloud from earth to sky. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's fight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's fight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Workers of the world unite beneath one banner for the right. Don't forget your brother's fight. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Bully, 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 boys, blow. Bully, 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 boys, blow. So, Joe Kennedy, the author of this, was the secretary treasurer of the new miners' union that was formed just a few days, actually formed on June 12th, four days after the, the fire. So at that point in time, the miners rose up and they started walking off the job. And a couple of old union organizers got together. Thomas Campbell was one of them. You can hear his name mentioned in here. Tom Campbell had been involved with, with union organizing for 30 years. Um, he was an IWW sympathizer. And Joe Kennedy was also an organizer. He was the secretary treasurer of the Metal Mine Workers Union that had just been formed and wound up having around 3,000 members. But at the same time, the craft unions, the electricians, uh, the carpenters, they also joined in. And this not only started a, a uh, movement in Butte that would last until December, but other individuals in other states, particularly Arizona, and those that were working for the Phelps Dodge Company, they went on strike. So there were minor strikes in Bisbee, which was a major strike, uh, Miami, Jerome, Globe. And so you'll hear these names mentioned in this particular song. Um, and you also hear a, a fellow by the name of, there, there are a couple of references to Khan, and the men talking to Khan. Well, I recognize that Khan was Khan Kelly. And um, I, I figured, okay, not everybody is going to know that Con Kelly is Con Kelly. So I did a quick Google search to bone up on Con Kelly. And one of the first things I happened upon was Tom Satterwick's 1971 master's thesis at MSU. He wrote about Con Kelly. And I thought that was great. Uh, uh, Jerome McCarthy I was talking to him the other day, and he said, wouldn't it have been great to be able to talk to Tom? Saturday yeah. about that. But anyway, uh, Con Kelly, Con Kelly's father, Jeremiah, was Daly's superintendent at the Anaconda. And so Daly knew Con Kelly from the time that Con Kelly was a child. And Con started working nine years old hauling water for railroad workers. And um, he, he, when he got older, he worked in Daly's office and was Daly's office boy. He went off, his father Jeremiah was a bit ambivalent about Khan getting into the mining game, but um, that's what Khan knew, it was what he had been exposed to all his life. He went off to the University of Michigan where he got a degree in mining engineering and an additional degree in law. Made his way back to Butte and dabbled in politics both local and statewide for a while, and, and law, in law and politics. But finally ended up working in the legal staff, or in the legal staff at the Amalgamated. Uh, besides having a close relationship with Daly, who was, as Jim had mentioned earlier, uh, a, a mine owner who, who started out as a miner, uh, Con Kelly also developed a very close relationship with uh, John D. Ryan. Mm -hmm. And so, K 
Kelly was getting both ends, both the the part of mining that came from the miners, but also the business end, the industrial the filthy lucre. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> the, 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 the industrial end from from Ryan. And Kelly became one of the one of the top negotiators for the company with the union. And uh, he was Con Kelly became an avowed industrialist and an avowed anti socialist. So that's who Con one of the things that, that's kind of interesting about this strike, it was the first real major strike in Butte in 39 years because there had been so much stability before 1912 and 1914. And I'm going to put some of the demands that, that the mine or the metal mine workers union wanted. They wanted recognition of the union, of course, and they wanted abolition of the rustling car. They hated that thing that's in front of you. They wanted a minimum wage of $6 a day because their wage at that point in time, at that point in time was anywhere between 350 to 4 475 and it just basically it really hadn't changed in almost 40 years and the cost of living had gone up and so they wanted their their wages to reflect that cost of living they wanted monthly safety inspections they wanted an escape plan for all the mines a, they wanted a grievance system and manholes in all mine bulk clubs because in that song the reason why so many miners got trapped is because there was bulkheads between other mines where they could have taken, if there had been a manhole cover in that concrete bulkhead, they could have gotten through into another mine and escaped, but they couldn't. And so, of course, the company's reply with Con Kelly was, no way, you're part of the IWW, get back to work, end of story. And they also started to, the, the company on paper started to do all sorts of interesting things by kind of twisting the fire to be a, um, what should I say, uh, involved with German immigrants over here. The fellow that, whose uh, carbide lamp lit the, the uh, uh, insulation of this particular cable, his name was, was Ernst Sal Salau, and of course the paper said, well, he was born in Germany, his parents are still in Germany, I bet you he set that on fire on purpose. And so they raised this anti-German, super patriotic, um, nationalist viewpoint, and um, what, what else are we going to hear in this song? We'll hear Tom Campbell, we'll hear Con Kelly, we'll hear about the Germans the, and the local press, and let's see, is there anything else that I'm missing? No, there won't be anything else that you're missing that they won't know. Okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's a bit presumptive on my part, but I think that this is, this was inspired, the whole song was inspired, the music was inspired by um, one of Butte's favorite groups, Solus, and who are official ambassadors of Butte, and I always wanted to do a Solus-like song, so I kind of <laughs> took uh, a Solus arrangement um, and put it into our, so here we go. On the 12th of June, we called the strike, which filled the miners with delight. In the union strong, we did unite the rustling car for the big fight. The Bisbee miners, no and kind, Miami was not far behind. In glow, they surely were on time. To join their brothers on the line. We're about to win, we will not sign. Standing on the firing line. The companies were money man. The strike made dividends were bad. The men to con these words did say they'd be twice as short.
of all we're full of him. Our password is we're bound to win. We're bound to win. We will not sign. So if you have any wow. questions, we'll field some questions. But I know.